I was walking through the partial denture department the other day and I ran into the manager, Jerry Lord, and I asked him to show me what are some of the most common problems that, uh, that his department sees. And he reached over and he grabbed this case and uh, he said, this is one we see all the time and I want to show you a solution we have that uh, he thinks is a great solution and I have to agree with him. This certainly presents some challenges relative to setting up teeth 7, 8, and 10 here. Uh, we want to put something in there that's going to stand the test of time, is going to function and not, you know, fall apart in a week or two. And we've got a really tight bite here and we don't have room for uh, mesh or relief under the mesh, a denture tooth and some acrylic to be able to fit in there, uh, and the guide planes that we might need as well. So we're even limited in placing like a metal pad with a post uh, centered in the middle for, for denture teeth. And back... Uh, in the 1970s or 80s, a doctor would prescribe uh, steel facings, and, and they were good for the time, but uh, I think Jerry's got a better solution for what uh, he does now. He basically uh, gets a refractory model, a waxing model, and has a technician wax up number 7, 8, and, uh, and number 10, and then the technician removes those, uh, and it gets sent to a technician who's actually going to make the uh, partial a framework and that's a specific team of partial denture um, anatomy specialists and after it's done uh, it goes back to the technician who wax the teeth the aesthetic specialist and then they opaque the metal substructure and then they apply um, a composite facing and so as you can look and see the uh, occlusion itself the lingual is in metal and then the opaque and the composite is on the front and that's pretty darn nice looking. I mean, I think we're all pretty pleased with how composites look. This is premise from Kerr that the lab uses, so it's a high quality composite. The exact same composite we would use on anterior teeth in the mouth, so it's no wonder it looks so good. I think it looks as good or better uh, as almost all denture teeth that I've seen, so this composite facing idea is fantastic. And as we look at the design, let me pop this into place. You can see an interesting feature here, as long as we're being cosmetic and using composite, you can see that we've got some pretty short arms here on these two clasps, these little snubber clasps, as we like to call them. And uh, you can do that on the buckle if you are able to get good mesiolingual retention. So really, you can see the, the majority of this clasp is on the lingual, engaging an undercut on the mesiolingual. And that's going to oppose the shorter buckle little snubber clasp here that hopefully won't cross uh, the midline of this tooth on the facial to kind of keep it hidden like it is here. And you can see again, engaging a mesiolingual undercut here that will oppose the little snubber clasp over here. You need this clasp on this side to oppose this for retention. You can't get away with just putting this lingual clasp here and having nothing on the buckle, but you need to make sure that there is, in fact, some undercut on the mesial lingual, and there has to be not um, too much undercut on the distal lingual. And so really, this is something that needs to be uh, taken care of at prep time, where you would come in here on this tooth, if you wanted to do a snubber clasp on this tooth, for example, and you would flatten this off, recontour the distal of this, make sure there's no undercuts. And then if there wasn't an undercut on the mesial lingual, you'd have to go in and create one by creating a taper uh, right above the gingiva, the free uh, margin of the gingiva. So this clasp could, in fact, engage that uh, on the mesial lingual, allowing uh, our technicians to put these very short snubber clasps there. Certainly, that's going to be a lot less apparent from the front than a lot of other clasp types. Um, it's really not recommended to do this, this type of lingual retention when you have a free end on the denture. But here we have no teeth behind it and here we have uh, its tooth board on this molar as well. And so we're safe doing this. But we really don't like to do this um, if in fact it's going to be a free end. And I happen to see one other case that he had uh, along those same lines. And I'll take this partial out so you can get an opportunity to see uh, over here on this side. Again, from number 12 to number 14, we need some teeth here. And again, we just don't have uh, the room to retain uh, denture teeth. And so again, you know, for the, the room for the mesh, uh, the relief under the mesh, the acrylic, 
<clears throat> and the denture teeth themselves. If it's attempted, it's just gonna break right out of there. And again, you can see by having the occlusion uh, completely in the cast metal, and then again, the composite being bonded to the outside. There's so many undercuts in this, in this metal that the composite's uh, bonded to that this is so much more resilient and so much stronger than if denture teeth were to be bonded here. It's kind of like the way um, on a direct composite, for example, you can have undercuts in the preparation and you could put direct composite like this and then cure it into place and it'll never come out because of the undercuts. And that's kind of what this is like versus if we were to bond a denture tooth on here, you can't have undercuts. And so it's kind of like putting an inlay in that same tooth. And as a result, with an inlay, you have to have a prep that's not only not undercut, but it's flared. And so the retention's not quite the same as when you can have those undercuts. So as this goes into place, again, by having the patient now occlude on those metal occlusals and making sure that when they come out in excursive functions, they're not hitting directly uh, on that composite. This is a great way to not only have very aesthetic teeth, in fact, you should consider these composite facings almost any time you've got anterior teeth on a partial. But in addition to being very aesthetic, they allow us to go into areas where we don't have a lot of intraocclusal clearance and be able to place some nice looking teeth in an area where previously we simply would not have room for acrylic and denture teeth. Here's another case that features lingual retention and a doctor with an open mind willing to take uh, some advice. He did some great uh, rest preps here, as you can see on the occlusal of uh, these teeth and patients missing teeth one through four and tooth number 14. So the doctor's RX actually prescribed an eye bar clasp on tooth number five and a circumferential clasp on 12 and on 15 and also um, asked for the use of a horseshoe major connector. And the partial denture designer uh, noted that there's a mesiolingual undercut on tooth number 13. So um, the designer suggested that we use that for lingual retention and then a buccal uh, snubber clasp to reciprocate that um, over on the buccal. And uh, again, that lingual clasp is gonna work pretty well because there's really no, as you look at this, uh, there's no undercut on the distal of that tooth. The designer also noted that the patient has a significant prominent rugae that needed to be relieved and the tissue undercut presented would need to be blocked out. And that would lead to a really bulky major connector, as you can imagine, kind of sitting over that. So the designer suggested a palatal strap instead. And you can see it's gonna stay clear of all these palatal rugae in the front and the anterior portion of the palate by, you can see where it's been marked back here for that palatal strap. And so the doctor said, yeah, it sounds great. Uh, go for it. And uh, here's what that looks like when it's placed on the model. And again, you can see that with the undercut present on the mesiolingual, that allows the use of that little snubber clasp. And there, it doesn't even come close to coming halfway around. And so from the anterior, we're probably not gonna see much of that at all. This is an older patient. This is a patient in their late 60s. So an eye bar clasp like this actually becomes almost an, an aesthetic clasp in a sense because as you've no doubt noticed as patients get older their upper lip tends to hang down more because of gravity and so does their lower lip and they start to show less and less of their maxillary teeth and more and more of their mandibular teeth so it's pretty good pretty good chances that the lip's going to be hanging down um, past that eye bar so it's aesthetic in older patients and it's kind of teeth like this one that already has some recession here because when the patient loads this and pushes down on that and that clasp has a tendency to move towards the distal and disengage uh, from the tooth. Whereas a typical circumferential clasp, if it was coming around this way, as the patient loads the partial, it moves in an occlusal direction and wants to rotate the tooth um, out of the socket. So the eye bar can actually be aesthetic even though it looks like uh, a lot of metal. And on another case, um, again, this is a doctor who's done some, some really nice rest preps here, if I can get this off. And um, he had written on the RX for a circumferential clasp on tooth number three, an eye bar on six, and a crib clasp over on 12 and 13. And when the designer surveyed the model, he saw an option again to kind of reduce 
um, the metal display on 12 and 13 by modifying the clasp design. And so like, just like with that last patient, we're going to use the mesiolingual uh, undercut on um, tooth number 12 and then a short uh, buckle snubber clasp to reciprocate that. We always, it's kind of like uh, retention on a crown prep. You know, you can't just have um, a flat plane on the facial here and call that retention. There has to be a flat plane in the gingival third here um, that's about as parallel or parallel to the plane over here on the facial uh, to get some mechanical retention for a crown. And so we always need to reciprocate with partials as well. We can have a clasp here, but then we need something over here to reciprocate that to create the actual retention itself. And then on number 13, they used a really aesthetic clasp which is really nice where the clasp actually originates. You can see the rest prep there where the doctor originally thought there would be a, a crib clasp there. But you can see that the aesthetic clasp on the distal of 13 originates from the mesial rest and then wraps around the lingual uh, to engage the distal undercut. And that really looks fantastic. And so as we look at that, we do have that little snubber still over here, but then we have nothing on 13 because that clasp is completely hidden. And typically that would be waxed like this. The crib clasp would have this and then the two circumferential clasps going around it. And this way we just have the short snubber on the first by and on the second by we actually kind of have the hidden clasp that goes from the mesial rest uh, around the lingual uh, onto the distal surfaces. So even though clasps by definition because they're metal may you know appear unesthetic or we might always think of them as unesthetic um, give the designers a chance you know if you don't have an idea in mind have them create for you or ask them to create uh, the most aesthetic way to be able to use metal in here you may have to have the patient back one more time and create some undercut on some of these teeth or remove some undercut on other parts of the teeth but as long as you're willing to do that and work with the designers uh, very often we can give you a design um, that you're going to be happy with and more importantly the patient's going to be happy because instead of seeing a bunch of metal they may not be able to see any metal at all or just a very small amount.